before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. For the last few weeks, we have been deep diving into the notorious Borgia family. We've looked at Rodrigo Borgia, we've looked at Lucrezia Borgia, and of course, we've looked at Cesare Borgia. Well, there's one Borgia whose life and who's unaliving and what happened to his body after the unaliving that still 500 years later remains an unsolved mystery. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a great big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers. Without you guys, this channel and this work would not be possible. If you would like to join our Patreon or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And today we're going to be talking about the unsolved mystery of Giovanni Borgia. Before we get into the episode today, just a quick note. If you are somebody that likes talking about scandalous practices, deep, dark occult practices, or the hidden mysteries in our matrix, in our world, we are doing a panel, a live panel event over on Gnostic TV. This panel is full of people who have survived the dark cult and people who have become very experienced researchers into the dark cult. This panel event, obviously on Gnostic TV, is going to be offered online so anybody all over the world can have access to these incredible speakers. If you would like a ticket to this event, you can text the word event to 321-216-8047. Again, text the word event to 321-216-8047. If you're texting from a country outside of the United States, then please make sure you put plus one in front of the number. So plus one, three, three, two, one, two, one, six, 80, 47. Anyway, all that information is also down in the description box below. So don't worry about grabbing a pen or a pencil. You could just scroll down to the description box and see the number right there. Just text event for your chance to get a ticket to something that I am very excited about. I've already done some interviews for this panel and this is such juicy information. And the fact that we're doing on Gnostic TV doesn't mean, it means that we don't have to worry about our words. We can say the, the real word, not the pretend word that we have to say a lot on YouTube. So make sure that you get your ticket to this event, regardless of where you are in, in the country or in the world. Not only is this stuff super interesting and very, very, jaw dropping as to what's really been going on. But the more we learn about this, the more we can spot it in our world around us. And the more we can course correct where we need to course correct. Of course, the word occult doesn't mean anything. It just means hidden. It's neither good nor bad. And so we're talking this more specifically about the dark occult, dark side of it. And so again, I hope you guys want to come to this event and want to see these speakers. So just text events to the number listed below. If you hear anything in the background, that is my dog. <laughs> Right now, he's scratching his ear. So if you hear any weird noises, that is what he is doing before we get into, into this very juicy story. You guys, when I started going into the Borgias, as you guys know, if you've been following along with this series on the Borgias, um, this is like one of my favorite historical families. Not like I want to be anywhere near them. Definitely, if I lived in this time period, would I not? I would not want to be in any any vicinity of the Borgias. In fact, the Borgias would probably piss me off if I lived in this time period. But the fact that we're separated from the Borgias by 500 years makes it very, very, very 
interesting to look at the shenanigans that these people got up to. Now, of course, Rodrigo Borgia was Pope Alexander VI. He was not the first Borgia Pope. His uncle Alfonso was also a Pope long before Rodrigo was a Pope. Um, again, he had multiple, multiple children. The four Borgia children, the four, four, the four full-blooded Borgia ch children, meaning they had the same father and the same mother, uh, Cesare Giovanni, who we're speaking about today, who was called Juan, Lucrezia, and Joffrey. They're the four that are kind of more notorious um, from this very scandalous family, historically speaking. And I've said this many times before, you can't speak about one Borgia without speaking about all of the Borgias. Uh, you know, them by themselves, their stories are no different than any other person at this time in our history, especially Renaissance Italy. They had very different cultural standard standards back then, but you put them all together and you've got the makings of a soap opera. We've got two different production companies that have recently, as of modern times, there's been other productions done about the Borgias in the past, but recently two production companies have done um, series based on them. Of course, Showtime, I've spoken about the Showtime series a lot with Jeffrey Irons um, called The Borgias. And then of course, I started watching another series that many people said was better. And this is called Borgia uh, Faith and Fear. And I will admit, if you're interested in watching some of these historical reenactments of the Borgias, I will admit, yes, the Borgia Faith and Fear is, in my opinion, overall done better. And the reason why it's done better, I think, than the Showtime series is that they really highlight all the families that were also involved in politics and in our culture, our global culture in Europe at this time, the Orsini's, the Medi uh, Medici family, which we've covered some of them before, um, the Coloni family, all of these families that were kind of duking it out in, in Italy, these, these uh, crime families, I guess we can call them. And that's something that they do better. They also show the violence a lot better of what this it was like just to live an, an, an ordinary life in the nobility of Renaissance Italy, just the violence that you were subjected to. They also show a lot of the superstitions. Now, the things that I don't like about Borgia Faith and Fear is I don't like the guy who plays Rodrigo Borgia. You, you can't beat Jeremy Irons, guys. Like Jeremy Irons is Jeremy Irons. And he, to me, will always be Rodrigo Borgia. Um, I also don't like, they focus a lot on history that we now know is not accurate. For example, as we get into this today, with the Borgia Faith and Fear series, they, in the beginning, the kids think that Rodrigo is their uncle. And this was a theory that the historians believed was true for a very long time. And then we got access to some of their diaries, not just their diaries, but other people's diaries from that time. And realized that this was not true at all. But the kids always knew that Rodrigo Borgia was their father. And as I've said many times before regarding the Borgias, in this time in history, as shocking as it is to us today, cardinals, archbishops, and the Pope most of the time had children. It was not weird. They were not hidden. Again, back then, 500 years ago, according to the mainstream narrative, the reason why people who worked for the papal states or the papacy did not have children had nothing to do with the story of Jesus. In fact, we know from the missing books of the Bible that Yahshua, the real person, was married, did have kids. The reason why back then they were not allowed to get married and have children was because of the wealth of the Vatican. The Vatican did not want to consolidate its power and its money into that one papal state. They did not want children who were legitimized, meaning they were born into wedlock, to be able to inherit any of the wealth that the Vatican carried through their father. So we know that historically at one point we thought the Borgia children believed that Rodrigo was their uncle until they found out later he was actually their father. However, that's inaccurate. We know now from the diaries that they absolutely knew, knew that he was their father. He was their father, and I think about sometimes like the Victorian era. Like maybe they started that rumor because the Victorian era was so conservative, like clutching your pearls, that anybody in a religious lifestyle, especially in Catholicism, would have illegitimate children. In the Protestant faith, we get married and have kids, so that's not shocking. Um, but now I think history is being corrected, and we know that back then, as I've said before, culturally. Things like intimacy were more laissez-faire within culture because of most marriages were arranged for political purposes. So people were really, really laissez-faire about 
mistresses and all that and intimacy, that kind of a thing. However, when it came to birth, in most cases, if you were born as a legal child, meaning you were born in wedlock, the state looked more favorably upon you, meaning that you could inherit from your father. If you were born out of wedlock, you usually were written out of any inheritance. So that's why these cardinals, these archbishops, the Pope, were not allowed to have legalized children because they would then, they, they then could not legally inherit from the Vatican. However, being a child of a cardinal or of a Pope, I saw this comment on another episode another podcast somebody somebody said how gangster is it to say my, my daddy's the pope um, you know like they still got a lot of perks being the children of these high-ranking vatican members and in fact even though they were not they were Ill illegitimate because they were born out of wedlock in a lot of ways the children of cardinals and popes were treated with more hierarchy than children born into royal families the Borgias themselves, though, were a whole other species unto themselves. Like they, even though a lot of what the Borgias did was pretty typical of, of what a noble would do at this time in history, just the arrogance. And it, they were just like savage in the way that they did it. And they reminded me a lot of like new money, of how new money behaves versus old money. And so because they were kind of new wave Orish, because they were a new powerful family, whereas the Orsinis, the Orsinis claim their family line back to like Romulus and Remus, right? That's that's how far back the Orsinis go. And then you've got the uh, Medecis and you've got the Schwartz, you've got all these big Italian families and these principalities because Italy itself was not its own country, warring it out. And they all have like full-blooded like ancestral stock in this area of the world. The Borgias were from Spain. They were Nuevo Rich. They had just risen to power. And so all of these spinning wheels bring us the story of the Borgias. And as I say, if you're new here, one of my favorite things about history and why I always loved history and why I was always really good at history and remembered history is because y'all, history ain't nothing but gossip. That's all history is. The fact that people are bored by history, if you're bored by history, you're doing it wrong. Are your teachers doing it wrong? This is literally days of our lives. This is literal gossip. We've already talked about and gossiped about the fact that it is rumored that Lucrezia and Cesare, Giovanni's brother and sister, were in a very inappropriate relation together. That story is over on Rumble because I couldn't put it here on YouTube. We've talked about Cesare being the inspiration for the portrait of Jesus. Again, that's over on Rumble. I'll link to that below as well. We've talked about all of Rodrigo's scandals and not scandals. Like he, there's a lot he did historically. He's the reason why Ferdinand and Isabel got married. He's the reason why Brazil speaks Portuguese and the rest of South America speaks Spanish. So there's a lot of things that, that they did that, that was a domino effect in history. When I got to Giovanni, I thought this is going to be a pretty quick episode, right? Like he didn't live that long. Like he only, you know, he did some scandalous stuff while he's alive, but then he like winds up in the river swimming with the fishes and it's unsolved. But when I got to the end, I thought, oh, my God. Oh, my God, you guys. Like, there is even more mystery to this dude. You know, we've talked about missing bodies before on this channel, especially over on Aquarius Rising Africa as well. And we have some speculation as to why certain bodies go missing. We also know that the powers that be with Lucrezia, Giovanni, or Juan's, as he was called, Juan's sister, that they still have, like, her hair. Ew. Ew. If you've got a 500-year-old hair... You might be weird. You might be a weirdo. I mean, and that's just, that's creepy. Like, don't do that. That's socially awkward. Yeah, that's like socially awkward and weird. You might have a personality disorder. But anyway, with that being said, let's get into Juan or Giovanni Borgia. We will be discussing this again on Aquarius Rising Africa on Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. I love covering this first on my channel so I can give you guys a heads up so that you guys can do your own research and then you can join us in the live discussion because it's always way more fun to gossip as a group than me just gossiping to you guys by myself. So let's get into Giovanni Borgia. So again, Giovanni Borgia go went by, his nickname was Juan Borgia. So even though legally his name was Giovanni, he was mo mostly known as Juan. That's what people called him. So let's get into Juan Borgia. We're gonna call him Juan. I will say, between the Showtime series of the Borgias and the other Borgia Faith and Fear, 
Another thing that was very different, I preferred the actors in the Showtime, not just Jeff Jeffrey Irons, except for Lucrezia. I preferred the Lucrezia in the other series. Also, one thing I want to point out before we get into it, I did not like the way that the Borgia Faith and Fear portrays the Borgia's relationship with religion. I thought that was way overdone. Listen, and Showtime did that better. Like Showtime, basically, with their Borgia series, they don't talk about God at all, even though they're in the Vatican, which is more realistic to the real Borgias. There was no, the real Borgias weren't concerned with the Holy Spirit. They weren't concerned with saving people. This was a political entity and they were clamoring to get to the top for their own power. God had nothing to do with it. All right. So in the other series, they focused more on like superstition and religion, which I don't think really played into the Borgias at all. We know Cesare himself was not really, he did not he claimed to be an atheist. I don't know if they had the word atheist back then. So uh, when we look at these, these family members who are so heavily tied to the Vatican, to Catholicism, please remember that even though it's, it's, it's very different than the way it is now, they use God as a manipulation to manipulate the people. And even the people knew they were being manipulated, but there was nothing they could do about it, right? So don't for one second think that these people cared about what was right and wrong or cared about God or cared about the salvation of another human being. Maybe Lucrezia, I'm pretty partial to Lucrezia. I'll tag her video down below. But as far as these sons of, of Borgia, as far as I'm concerned, they were just as corrupt, if not more corrupt than their father. But again, with that being said, humans are complex. There's complexities. I've said this before. None of us lived back then. We Listen, if I had to be placed... 500 years ago, if someone were to come pick me up and take me back 500 years ago and said I got to pick where I was going to live, I would pick to be a peasant because the commoners, the peasants had way more freedom, had way more autonomy than the people in the nobility. In the nobility, it was dog eat dog, especially for the women. So as far as their behavior and the complexity of their behaviors, I do give them, even Cesare, I give them a little bit of grace. Because I'm sure that these kids are full on survival mode. They're full on survival mode. Right? And they're also trying to dominate their power because if, if they don't dominate their power, they could be killed. All right. So we have to give them a little bit of grace. And that's unfortunately that's what happened to Juan Borgia. All right. So who was Juan Borgia? Juan Borgia was born in 1476. He was the second son to Rodrigo Borgia and his chief mistress, Voneza. Juan was brought up with his full-blooded siblings. So Cesare was his older brother, then came Juan, then came Lucrezia, and then came Joffrey. So the first part of Juan's early life was very, a very enmeshed family. In fact, that's one thing I said in Cesare's episode. Someone brought this, this point up, like at the end of the day, this is a family. This is a family. They were corrupted by power, sure, but they are still a family. These are siblings. Most of you guys grew up with siblings in your house with you day in and day out. They all just dealt with this together. And so we have to remember that even though they didn't like each other, sometimes they were very loyal to each other because they were full-blooded siblings. Now, Rodrigo Borgia had plenty of other children that were their half-siblings. We're going to talk about one specifically today. A lot of them did pass away before they got to adolescence, as, as what happened back then. Um, but, uh, but their half-blooded siblings were not as close to them as their full-blooded siblings were. They spent a lot of time in both the Showtime series... And the other series do show this. They, they, they're they all mama's boys and they're very close to their mother. And of course, they're close to their father. And so there's some commonality there, I think, between our understanding of our siblings. One of my favorite memes, I, I laugh at this because when I read this meme, I thought about my siblings. There was this meme going around that was like, sibling, sibling relationship is weird. I would give you my kidney in a heartbeat. My siblings, I give you my kidney in a heartbeat. But you can't touch my charger. Right? Like how unique and odd is that sibling re relationship you would give your your kidney to your sibling in a heartbeat no questions asked but you can't touch my charger right and with full-blooded siblings too i find especially the older that i get when your parents start aging you and your siblings are all that's there to deal with that 
and things that happen in your family, you and your siblings are the only one that truly understands them. More so than your spouses or your friends or even your cousins, your full-blooded siblings, the kids you grew up with who share the same DNA as you, the same parents as you, there are just certain things about your childhood and your cultural experience within your, within your own home that your siblings are only going to ever really understand. It is a unique relationship. It is a strange relationship at times, but nonetheless, it is family. And so Juan, for better or for worse, the Borsha, the four Borsha kids that were full-blooded siblings grew up just like we did today in a household with each other. As I said, Rodrigo Borgia, who at this point in our story was still just a cardinal, did have other half-siblings, had other illegitimate children that were half-siblings of the four. One of these was a guy named Pierre Luigi. Now, Pierre Luigi lived in Spain. And in 1493, Pierre Luigi was granted dukedom by Ferdinand. Again, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, Rodrigo Borgia, had given them dispensation to get married. There is some allegations that the Borgias could be of the House of Aragon as well, which was Ferdinand's house. Now he was given, Pierre Luigi was given the dukedom, which a duke is a prince, right? That's a prince of an area of called Granada. Now Granada is in the south area of what we call Spain today. And this is a very interesting history here. We know that Isabella and Ferdinand were big with trying to get rid of the Moors, the Islamic uh, people, and the Jewish people that were in Spain at the time. They were big with um, the in Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, a very, very violent time, not just in Spain, but for our whole history. And they were kind of part of the people that really kicked this off. And Granada, which is, again, an area of the south of Spain, is right on the Mediterranean coast, at this point had been a stronghold for the Islamic population of Spain. I've spent a lot of time in Spain. Spain is a beautiful country, but you can definitely see a lot of the um, Islamic influence still in the architecture of some of these old buildings in Spain. And if we look at the map of where Granada is, it's close to Morocco. You can get to Morocco pretty easily, which we know today Morocco was still very much a an Islamic uh, country. So Pierre Luigi had been born between 1458 and 1460. So he was a good bit older than his half siblings, Cesare, Juan, Lucrezia, and Geoffrey. And he'd been sent off to his home of Spain, which was also the Borgia home, to assist Ferdinand as he got older with this Granada problem, with, with the Moors who were still holding strong in Spain. Granada or the Emirate of Granada was one of the last independent Muslim states in the late 15th century. It had been established as a Muslim state since 711. And the Granada War was one that had raged for a few uh, decades. And eventually, Pierre Louis Luigi, Rodrigo Borgia's son, had really assisted big time militaristically and bringing Granada back into the holds of Christendom, or probably more appropriate saying the crown of Argonne. And so because of his allegiance to Ferdinand and what he did to bring this area of Spain right on the Mediterranean into the control of, of Ferdinand, of the House of Aragon, Ferdinand again granted him this dukedom. He became the first duke of Granada for the House of Borgia. So again, a duke is a prince. So by getting this title to Pierre Luigi, we're also going to see further down the line that Cesare is granted dukedom in, in France, right? So getting these titles is giving these children of a pope way more power and way more privilege. Now, Pierre Luigi Borgia was also contracted to marry a woman who was Ferdinand II's cousin. This was a woman named Maria Enrique de Luna. So after Pierre Luigi establishes quite a fortune and quite a title for himself, it is decided by Rodrigo Borgia, his father, that Juan Borgia, at 12 years old in 1488, would actually go live with Pierre Luigi. Now, we spoke about what this was Cesare. So between Cesare and Juan, they were very close in age. There was a lot of tension. And Rodrigo Borgia had decided that Cesare would be in the cloth. He would be work for the church. And Juan himself would be a military power. So he would be in the secular war. So while Cesare was being tutored in these private schools, learning canon law and civil law as a eventually to be a cardinal. And I believe that 
Rodrigo wanted him to also one day be the Pope. Juan was sent to live with his half-older brother to learn more military, as after all, again, Pierre Luigi had been part of the reason why Granada, militaristically in these wars with the Muslims, had brought this part of Spain, of Spain back into the House of Aragon. And so obviously, Pierre Luigi had skills when it came to the military. Funnily enough, those skills will play out more with Cesare later on, but that's a story for a different person whom we've already covered, and those links are down in the description box below. This story today is about Juan. So Juan goes off to live with his half-brother, all right? His half-brother, it's, you know, he's like, what, 30 years old? Maybe like 28, 30 years old at this time. He still hasn't married his betrothed, which is Fernand the, the second's cousin. So once he marries her, he is like, for sure, secured into a royal house a royal dynasty especially once they start having some babies but but something happens so the beginning of 1488 one who is born in italy gets sent to spain to live with his half older brother to train with his half older brother to learn military skills his half older brother again he's the Duke of Granada, the first of the House of Forja. He's engaged to be married into the Spanish royal family, which got Ferdinand and Isabel at this time were one of the most powerful empires in Europe. So this is a trajectory of Juan. But less than a year after Juan gets to P Pierre Luigi's house to train, Pierre Luigi meets his demise. It's not exactly sure how Pierre Luigi was unalived, but it wasn't by a heart attack. We know that assassins were involved. Now, again, the Borgia family themselves are always, they've always got people after them. So not only does Pierre Luigi have like Italian folk and other houses vying for popedom and cardinal them through the power of the Vatican after him because he's the son of Rodrigo Borgia. But he's also just done this war with Granada. So obviously he's not a fan of the Moors or the Moors aren't a fan of him. So it's very sketchy as to how he met his demise, but nonetheless he did. And so here is Juan who's 12 years old, who just got ripped from his house with his siblings and sent to Spain where his family is technically from, but he's from Italy. Like he's not... Even though he spoke Catalan at home and spoke Spanish with his family at home, Duan wasn't born in Spain. So he's being at 12 years old being sent to this other country. Then his half brother, who is his protector and teacher, is unalived very dramatically. What's a 12 year old to do? Well, as one does when one has passed on from life, one usually has a will. Even back then, people made sure their affairs were in order. And especially if you're the Duke of Granada. So they go to read Pierre Luigi's will. Pierre Luigi gives, because he had no children or legitimate children at this time. So he gives the dukedom to his half-brother Juan. So Juan becomes the second Duke of Granada. So now upon Pierre Luigi's untimely passing, Juan is now a prince. Bippity-boppity-boo. He becomes a prince. He also receives in the will the betrothal to Ferdinand II's cousin, Maria. This is so weird, y'all. Like, so women, we know women were not, women, women were not autonomous people back then. We were property. And so the fact that you can will your fiance or will your wife to another person is bananas to me but nonetheless that's what happened maria enrique de luna was now betrothed to juan now maria was actually closer to juan's age she was born in 1474 he was born in 1476 she was two years older than him which was a far cry from her previous betrothal so i guess that was good for maria but nonetheless her engagement is shifted to juan now, like Lucrezia, his sister, years to come, when she becomes of age, the same thing kind of happens to Juan. Because Juan is younger at this time, they do they have to wait a little bit for him to actually marry Maria. But in August of 1493, when Juan is 17 years old, he is sent back to Spain after his 
half brother passed away and he goes back to Italy, gets these titles, gets this engagement. Then he's sent back to Spain by his dad to do the deed to marry into the house of Aragon to marry Ferdinand's cousin, Maria. Now it is said that he spent sent Juan into Spain with all this pomp and circumstance. Like there was just parades and there was jewels and it was just very new nuevo rich like right like very new money like very gaudy and that was the borgia family like they were gaudy they, they wore expensive clothes you can definitely see them coming a mile away and so he goes into spain to marry maria and marry her he does juan and maria spent three years together in blissful matrimony in spain they had two children legitimate children out of their union now juan himself also also wouldn't be a borgia without it had illegitimate children from other mistresses but he had two legitimate children with his wife maria so having these two children really secured him into this nobility right he's not only the son of the pope not only is he now the second duke of granada but he's got babies now full-blooded babies with a woman who is cousin to Ferdinand of Aragon. Juan de Borgia y Enrique was born on November 10th of 1494. He would go on to be the third Duke of Granada. Isabella de Borgia y Enrique was later born on January 15th of 1497. Now, even though little Juan, his son, would, would only live a few years with his father, probably didn't have many memories of his father, Isabel is another story. She would never know her father because a few months into Maria's pregnancy with his daughter, Juan gets called back to Rome by his father. So Isabel was born seven months after her father had left Spain. And again, she would never know her father. Once Juan arrived back in to Rome, he was bestowed even more titles by daddy. At this time, daddy was a pope. Daddy wasn't a cardinal anymore. Daddy was the Pope. And again, as that comment said, how gangster is it to say your daddy is the Pope? And if your daddy is the Pope, then your daddy is the kingiest of kings because he sits on the top of the pyramid. All the kings all over the land have to grovel at the Pope's feet for what they want. So what the Pope wants, the Pope gets. And Rodrigo Borgia wanted nothing more but the House of Borgia to dominate in power all over Europe. And how is he going to do that? by through his children and his children's children. So Juan comes back to Rome. He's done his deed. He is the second Duke of Granada. He has married into the royal family and he has got two babies with the said royal family. There was some speculation between a lot of the turbulence between Cesare and Juan about that turbulence being, be, being because Rodrigo seemed to favor Juan. And I don't know if it's that he favored him. It's that Cesare was in, at this point, was working in the cloth. He was in the Vatican. He was growing. He was still studying. And still learning how to manipulate with law, whereas Juan was already out there in the secular world doing the things that he needed to do to secure power in the secular world. And so these titles that Rodrigo gave Juan, it wasn't because I think he favored Juan more. It's because they were on two different trajectories. One was a slower trajectory of power where one was a faster. But regardless, I think he loved both his sons equally and used both his sons equally. But in his maturity, understood that one son's path was going to take a lot longer than the other. Nonetheless, these are the titles that Rodrigo gave Juan Borgia when he returned back to Rome. He became the Duke of Sessa, the Grand Constable of Naples, the Governor of St. Peter's, and the Captain General of the Church. So basically, the Captain General of the Church was now, he was the head of the Papal Army. They show this pretty well in the Borgia Faith and Fear, like the amount of violence and why the army existed. That's one of the reasons why I like this series is they show the extreme violence that was going on at the time. The papal army would literally slaughter people. If you tried to get something from the Vatican that wasn't yours, you would be speared by one of these military men. The papal army, we also again have to remember that you've got these principalities all over Italy. There's not one country, unified country. And so this, this army of, of the papals were the papal states. So they were also set to defend themselves. So now Juan is literally, he's like the General Flynn of the Vatican, right? Like he is like the top dog of one of the most powerful militaries in the world. And he didn't really earn it. Like I could see Pierre Luigi, if he had lived, earning this title because he kind of proved that he could do it. 
but Juan was given this title. So he's like the head and he's still very young, even though he's accomplished all this stuff, he's still extremely young. Like he is not, his brain, his frontal lobe has not finished developing. And one thing that the Showtime series did better is they showed the volatile, the, Juan, 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 was, Juan was volatile. Like Juan was a partier. They show that way more in the Showtime series than in the other series. That Juan, I, the, the guy they casted as Juan in the Showtime series, I think really played Juan very very well as far as like what we know of one his volatility his 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 masculinity he was a loved going to brothels so so anyway with that being said it's no surprise what ended up happening to him not only was he part of the most hated family at the time but his daddy was a pope and there were all these warring factions he was married into the spanish royal family he was there was just a lot going a lot of targets on juan's back and so let's talk about the night of his demise and let's set the scene of what happened that night it was the 14th of june 1497 juan was leaving the home of his mother with his siblings after dinner it was very common for all four siblings to meet up at their mother's house for a family meal their mother's house was near the Basilica of St. Peter in Chains. This was about seven kilometers from the Vatican. As the children were heading back to the Papal Palace after dinner where they lived, Juan decided he was going to seek further entertainment for the night and departed from his brother with his valet and another man who had been seen with Juan before. This other man, mysterious man, who had been seen with Juan, was seen to always wear a mask. Now, multiple witnesses saw Juan depart from his brother with this masked stranger and his valet. He had his valet drop him off at an area of Rome called the Square of the Jews. It is said by witnesses that Juan told his servant, his valet, that if he was not back by 10 p.m., he could leave. At that point, Juan and the unknown man, masked man, rode off together on a mule. By the next day, when Juan did not return back to the Papal Palace, his father, the Pope, ordered a search. At first, they found the body of the servant who had been waiting for Juan. The servant had been brutally unalived. As the locals started to realize that they were searching for an important person, a local a commoner came forward and said, I saw five men throwing a man who looked to be very wealthy into the river. This was near a location called the Hospital St. Jerome. When asked by the authorities why this man had not reported this earlier, the man laughed and said, yo, like, bodies are being thrown into the river all the time. It was just a regular Tuesday. Like, I didn't think anything of it. But now that I know you're looking for somebody who's important, this guy, he had on very refined and rich looking clothes. And so they basically went through the river where they found the body of Juan. Juan had been multiple times. He had his throat. And more importantly... One, okay, so I, I listened to a, po a podcast, a, a historian talk about this particular unsolved unaliving and why it's so peculiar. And this particular horse historian seemed to know a lot about historical fashion. The Renaissance, I, I thought this was just very interesting, what she said. The Renaissance was a very, again, gaudy time period. We're talking about everything is changing. We're coming out of the Dark Ages. People were very colorful. They were very colorful. They put time and effort into their clothing, especially the wealthier families. It was very common to see men wear stockings, one color on one leg, one color of the other. They were dressed and decked out in their diamonds, especially the new money like the Borgias. And so if you can imagine that, here comes Juan Borgia through a, a ghetto, through a more um, a, a, a filthier side of town where there's all these brothels. And he's walking through these brothels with these really fine clothes, very colorful clothes, you can definitely tell, if you don't know who he is, you can definitely tell he's someone of importance. Now, when they pulled the body out of the river, another thing that was interesting about Juan is that he had all of his jewels on him. 
He even had a purse attached. That's what they would wear, like this attached perch purse to their trousers. That's kind of like, I mean, no offense, but when people describe this, I'm like, that's a fanny pack. Like, that's literally what that is. I don't know why they don't just call it what it is. It's a fanny pack. Like, you think about a fanny pack, that's what they wore. Like a, a purse that was attached to their belt, right? With coins in it. And when they pulled one out of the river, they found his purse, his fanny pack, still attached to his pants, with all his gold, gold coins still in them. And the amount of gold that he had on him was significant. Like he was walking around with a bunch of money on him. I don't know culturally what it was like back then, but I know you don't walk around with a bunch of cash on you, especially if you live in a city like I live in Atlanta. I'm not going to walk around with hundreds of dollars in my wallet. Like that's just not going to happen, especially if I pull my wallet out to buy something and someone spots that. Like that's stupid. Like it's stupid. So listen, listen, y'all. If you're going to be fanny packing it around Rome, Italy, or any town, maybe don't carry so much money on you. <laughs> like, just saying. It's so much easier just to cancel your cards, all right? But anyway, Juan's fanny pack is secure. All of his jewels are still on him. So immediately we know that his unaliving was not done because of a robbery or because of any scuffle that would have happened in this ghetto. Because even if they're just scuffling between him and some poor person once he's unalive they're probably still going to take his jewels and his money they're not stupid right there's no way to track this stuff back then but no his body's dumped into the river with everything all of his riches still intact so this tells us this tells us this tells us that his unaliving was planned and again we got a lot of suspects because no one likes the borgias now as i said the first suspect we have is cesare and you know who really pushed this? His wife, Maria. She and her cousin's wife, Isabel, the queen of Spain, were like, it was Cesare. And you remember, Cesare is going to go on, if you watched our episode with Cesare, to have some tension between Ferdinand as part of why he gets his demise later on. It has a lot to do with Ferdinand. So they're like, it's Cesare. We've got to take him to court and charge him with unaliving, which I didn't really know you could do that back then. It kind of sounds like they were pushing. I mean, I guess I did know you could do that, but it wasn't like we do it now where you have to send it to the DA and they has, the, the DA has to have enough evidence to put the warrant out for someone's arrest. No, the nobility's like, we think you killed someone, so we're going to take you to court. So that was really, they were pushing for that, but there's really no proof that it was Cesare. And a lot of historians have agreed that Cesare probably had nothing to do with his brother's demise. Yes, there was tension between the two of them, but show me brothers where there isn't tension. You know, they did share a lover, which was Sancha, which was their younger brother, Joffrey's wife, talking about a Melrose place, if ever there was one back in the, you know, 15th century. They're, you're both boinking your young brother's wife. And Joffrey himself becomes a suspect. People speculate that Joffrey was the one that had Cesare unalive because of his jealousy over Juan being his wife's lover. But Cesare was also his wife's lover, and Joffrey didn't do anything to Cesare. And again, most people kind of discard Joffrey because he was really young at the time, too. And I don't know if he was just equipped to pull something like this off. So nonetheless, both Cesare and Joffrey are suspects. Cesare, more of the suspect. But Daddy, Pope Daddy being the Pope, was able to call off the court that wants to try Cesare for his own brother's unaliving. It really helps when your father's the Pope. Now, another big family, which I kind of have my money on this being the case, was the Orsini family. They were very hostile to the Borgias and um they just they got into a lot of crap a lot of shit with the Borgias and again the Orsini's ruled Italy I mean they literally claim to be the descendants of literally Romulus and Remus and the Orsini's are still a huge family in control of the world and so it would not put it past would not put it past me to have them hire assassins to take out Juan we know they also tried many times to take out Cesare so that's kind of where my money lies is more on the Orsini family. There's also another family, another man that ha that got the blame as well. He was a potential suspect. This also makes sense to me too, even though my money's more on the Orsinis. This was another man, local man, who was a, represent a representative a lot of, of a lot of the older families in Italy, like the Orsinis. He wasn't an Orsini. But legend states that his daughter had been... Um, R-A-P-E-D'd by Juan. And I can believe this because Juan literally was very volatile and definitely was very, very much, whereas Cesare was also volatile. Cesare, I feel like, was more controlled. 
Cesare seems like the older soul. Like he was more controlled. He didn't go off the handle. He definitely thought things through. Whereas Juan would act on impulse. And so it is stated that the father of this daughter was one of the suspects because Juan had deflowered her against her will. Um, if that were to be the case, if he were the person that did this, I don't think it would have anything to do with protecting his daughter, but just making sure his daughter was pure enough to be married off to a proper, I think it had a lot to do with her being a property, but nonetheless, I still see it as the Orsini's. Now, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, this other series, the Borgia Faith and Fear, they pin it on Lucrezia. And I listened to a couple, I was like, what? Because I never heard Lucrezia being a suspect for Juan's unaliving. And I really thought about that. And I was like, well, I mean, if Joffrey's a suspect, if Cesare is a suspect, why not Lucrezia? Especially if Lucrezia herself, go back and watch her video, the video I did on her. She had been used and abused by her brothers, by her father, by a bunch of men her whole life. And I was thinking if she had heard that Juan had done this to another girl, would she not be mad enough to get rid of her brother? I don't know. I don't think she did it. Um, again, I tried to scour to find any information on her being a suspect or why. That might have been creative liberty taken by the production company. Some historians in these podcasts had mentioned that it was that it was created by this production company, but there could still be evidence, like where do they get that information from that maybe she was also a suspect. I don't know. Her, if she was somebody who was unaliving people, though, we know that her method of unaliving was poison, was not hiring assassins. So anyway, anyway, again, I think it was the Orsini family. That's my bet. I know a lot of people want it to be Cesare. It could have very well been Cesare. I just think that it was the Orsini family. Nonetheless, we still don't know who did it. We still don't know who did it. And again, it could have been anybody. The Borgias were hated by everyone. But nonetheless, the Pope did call off the trial against Cesare. And because of that, people speculate that the Pope actually did know who did it. And he was protecting whoever did it. That's what gives more credence to it being one of his kids. Because once he had the court call off the investigation into Cesare, he called off the investigation as a whole on who killed Juan. Because I, I guess he just didn't want people. He, I guess he kind of knew who did it and he wanted to protect it. So I don't know. I don't know, you guys. It's again, there could be many reasons as to why he called up the investigation. Maybe he didn't want to piss the Orsini's off. Maybe he felt like, well, the Orsini's took one of my kids, so I don't want to cause any more turbulence for them to perhaps take another. There could have been many, many reasons why he did that. Again, the highest speculation, though, is that he knew who did it, and it was one of his family members. Anyway. All right. This is where it gets even more interesting, though, guys, because Juan is now gone. He is now unalived. He's unalived. So... Listen what happens next. This is where the plot thickens, y'all. All right. His body is first brought to the Castile Saint Angelo, which was a mausoleum of Hayden. So this was a rotunda, still a rotunda, not was. It's a rotunda that was built by the Emperor Hayden. So this is a mausoleum. This is old. This is old. You know, Hayden's Wall up in Scotland that, that divides that, that Hayden. That Hayden. All right, so this is, even for them, even 500 years ago, this was old. So his body is basically laid in state, like a politician would be. So after he's laid in state in Hayden's mausoleum, what a slap across the face that is to the Orsini's, right? Because that's like their dude. And now he's laying in state. He's taken to another basilica. And this is the Basilica of Santa Maria del Popolo. Now, his body was brought there, again, with pomp and circumstances. This young child of the Pope, who was swimming with the fishes, 120 torchbearers, walked down with his body lying on briars. And I don't, it must have stunk to high heaven. So they lay him on briars, on these flowers, with these torchbearers, so people can come pay their respects to the slain body of the Pope's son. In 1500, Bonesa, his mother, is granted permission to build this family mausoleum, right? And not only is, is this going to be where Juan is laid to rest, but they're going to move Pierre Luigi's body here as well, because Bonesa actually cared a lot about 
this other child of Rodrigo's. And so she's going to put like these important Borgia children in this mausoleum. You don't get a mausoleum unless you're somebody important. But however, my friends, the plot thickens. Because in 1658, the Borgia Chapel, the mausoleum, was demolished when they were like revamping and redoing the Basilica. When that happened, you would think, you would think, you would think that he got these bodies, these famous bodies, because in 1658, even though it's still a long time ago for us, the Borgias were still important to their history, too. So you would think that they would take care of these bodies that were about 150 years old. No, the bodies got lost. Y'all, the bodies are lost. <laughs> nobody to this day, 2024, nobody knows. Nobody knows where Juan Borgia goes. Nobody knows where Pelig uh, Pierre Luigi goes. We don't know where their bodies are. I call foul. I think we absolutely know where the fuck their bodies are. I think the powers that be have their bodies. Why would they save parts of like Lu Lucrezia's hair? Why? Because there's DNA. There's DNA. They know how to create people with DNA. We've heard Caleb from Aquarius, Rising Africa talk about this. We've talked about the incubator babies. So where are the bodies? We've done a whole series, y'all on missing body parts of the elite and the establishment. And I just literally pissed my pants laughing. I, I knew when I started covering the Borgias, I knew Juan had an unsolved demise, but I didn't know that his body was missing. How the hell do you lose a body, y'all? It's like Mata Hari's head. We covered Mata Hari. I'll place that down below. Where's her head? How do you lose a head? I mean, I'm not a betting or gambling woman, but if I were, I would bet that somebody knows exactly where that body is. Somebody knows exactly where that body is, and they're using it for whatever purposes. And Pierre Luigi. They're both Borgias. So anyway, you guys, that's the unsolved mystery of Juan's unaliving and his body. So what do you guys think about that? And again, we will be over on Aquarius Rising Africa. I'll link that channel down below at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time this upcoming Monday, July 15th to talk about this case. And you guys know Shanti has so much experience with whistleblowers from this dark cult that she'll probably have a lot more to say about the missing body. So I cannot wait to hear Shanti's opinion. And I cannot wait to hear y'all's opinion too. So leave your comments down below. Join us on Aquarius Rising on Monday. And I thank you guys for sitting through that. Again, all the other Borgia videos will be listed down below, including the one that's too scandalous to be on YouTube that's over on Rumble. All right, you guys, I'll talk to you soon.